And we'll give, get a, excuse me, good afternoon, everyone. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so so we can have more of our attendees get audio connected. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the 2024 OVS VAP Training Center webinar. OVS presents, how would you help uh, self-regulation as a stepping stone to co-regulation? I am Blake Hush, the Training and Outreach Unit Chief here at OVS. And our, on our screen, you can see our Acting Director, John Watson, is also with us today. And he's going to offer some opening remarks shortly. In the meantime, I'm going to cover just a little webinar housekeeping. We have made ASL interpretation services available for today's training and spotlighting our interpreters can be done at the bottom of your Zoom window. I believe it's an interpretation icon. If you click on that, and a special shout out to both uh, uh, Daniel and Remy today for helping us with, with interpreting. Today's webinar is a series of web as part of a series of webinars we are offering through the VAP Training Center, and we hope you get the most out of it. If, if you happen to want to revisit what was covered, uh, slides will be shared with you momentarily and in a follow-up email, as well as this webinar is being recorded and will be published on our YouTube channel, which we can share with everyone post-training as well, link to that. Uh, all of those links are also available on our training page or access to the YouTube channel is available there as well, which is just obs.ny.gov forward slash training. Um, finally, as you exit today's webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey on the presentation. Please take a couple minutes to give us feedback. I think it's 11, maybe 12 questions, and they're really quick and can be done in just a couple minutes. That feedback is incredibly helpful, and especially since this is a webinar in a series, what we would do is take any feedback you give to us with this one. We would share both with our presenter, Myra, today, as well as if there's some tips and tricks that we think is uh, helpful in, in preparing for our next one, we will make changes uh, in real time. So it's incredibly valuable, and I, I hope you'll take advantage of that. With that said, I'd like to turn things over to our actor and director, John Watson, uh, who's going to welcome Myra, and we'll get going. Thank you, Blake. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of three OBS National Crime Victims Rights Week themed webinars. How would you help? Options, services, and hope for crime survivors. This theme and these webinars are a call to action to create safe environments for victims and survivors to share their experiences so they can help, so they can be connected with the help that they need to heal. I am John Watson, Acting Director and Counsel and the Temporary Face of OBS. Once the governor's office fills the vacancy here, we will be sure to let everybody know. Today's webinar, as Blake said, is the first of three in this How Would You Help series. Two more are planned for April 17th and the 24th, both at 1 p.m. So remember to mark your calendars. I want to thank the Training and Outreach Unit for helping organize this series. Training and Outreach has also given me the privilege to introduce our guest presenter this afternoon. We are pleased to have with us Myra Strand from Strand Squared Solutions. Strand Squared Solutions got its start in 2017, and today Myra is the owner of this terrific resource through which she provides training and education. Myra is a certified as a Comprehensive Victim Intervention Specialist Advanced. Myra began working with people who've experienced trauma in 1995 she has had myriad experiences, including those in the areas of death notification, victims fleeing domestic violence and engaging with family court, and with, and with survivors of all types of crimes. Each year, Myra provides training and technical assistance to professionals in the area of trauma-informed and healing-centered services, advocacy skills, technology and its relationship to victimization, implicit bias and applied intersectionality, and professional wellness and organizational trauma. With that, have a great afternoon. 
Thank you for your attention to this presentation. And now I'll pass it on to Myra. Thank you, John. And thank you, Blake. And thank you, Daniel. Um, I really appreciate the time to be able to be a part of this amazing series. Um, I'm, I'm a relatively new res resident of New York. I moved here during the pandemic in 2020, and I've really discovered that this is just such a wonderful place, su such a wonderful place to live, and I'm so pleased to be here. So today's presentation, self-regulation, a stepping stone to co-regulation, is, is really... Um, is really an important training for me. And, and we're gonna move through and um, really, really kind of get into some ideas. But one thing is we're limited with two hours. So every idea that I present, I want you to see it as like a, as a, as a place to start, right? It's a new starting place because I'm gonna introduce several concepts that in and of themselves, if you dive down their rabbit holes, you'll find a whole body, body of information, right? So this is a very broad perspective, a very broad view. The first thing that I wanna start off with is um, this training was built under the understanding that we're working with victims of crime, right? We we have a lot of complicated responsibilities in this, in this role and we're working with a great deal of trauma. If you do experience a trauma echo, that's what I like to call them, trauma echoes, because you know it's, it's, it's no longer, we're starting to realize that using the word trigger is problematic in and of itself. So um, because there's there's the possibility of trauma echoes in this space, I just wanted to let you know, and I kind of want to work with this concept and massage it just a little further. So let's let's think about trauma echoes and kick it off with this video. You feel joy in your movements. When your heart is broken, you feel it over here. When your gut is wrenched, you feel it over here. So, uh, so Emotions are really about physical sensations. Trauma is about having unbearable physical sensations. Right? So you can go to your psychologist and yak about what has happened to you. But the core issue is not what happened to you, but the fact that your body got stuck in heartbreaking gut wrench. And so somehow you need to be helped to learn to re-own your body. We did a study on the immune system and trauma and saw that basically when people get traumatized, their immune system starts overreacting and starts attacking themselves. And I think that was a very good metaphor for people's bodies getting stuck in a state of terror. So I've explored many different methods of dealing with trauma. Uh, I found that yoga has had the best reception. When you're a traumatized person, it feels like nothing will ever change. When you do yoga, you notice you can put yourself in some damn uncomfortable pose, and before too long, it's going to be over. And you get that sense of time, which is a very important thing in helping to overcome trauma, because sucky things happen to people all the time, and the way you move through life, you say, okay, today it sucks, but tomorrow is not a day. Huh? So you have this sense of time that allows you to have that perspective. When you get traumatized, that perspective of this too shall pass disappears. And so reestablishing that sense of time, which yoga does so well, is another very important part of what yoga can do for people. All right, so let's go back to this concept, right? There's a possibility that you might experience a trauma echo. A trauma echo is something that lives not just in your head, which honestly, a trauma echo warning is a very intellectual endeavor. What we want to do is we want to recognize the somatic experience of trauma, that it's actually inside your body, right? We don't witness trauma, we experience it. And we're going to connect all these dots in a minute. So what I would like to invite you to do is, in case you experience a trauma echo, I invite you to explore your trauma echo. 
right? Maybe take some time to identify your response. Pay attention to your emotional and physical reaction when you're feeling this, this moment of overwhelmed. Maybe even retrace your steps. Like what was it specifically that brought that trauma echo on? Was it something that the speaker said? Was it brought on by an emotion that was elicited? Was it brought on by a smell or something that you saw, right? Or was it brought on by just a general feeling of feeling panic or anxiety? like kind of reflect on that and try to understand that what I like to do is I like to write it down as soon as I experience a trauma echo I, I, I press pause or I stop what I'm doing and I write it down so I can take that with me to my my therapist my trusted confidant and we can actually really process our way through that and find and, tr and try to figure out a way to navigate and mitigate my own trauma echoes that's truly the beginning part of self-regulation right and that's one of the goals here is we experience the possibility that we might might experience a trauma echo but then we we sit with that trauma echo we write it down we we work with it we massage it we we find a way through that so then that way we're no longer um we're no, we're no longer bound by moments in the past our body we're releasing that trauma from our body we're working with it one of the things that I like to do is I like to use my glimmers. Did you know a glimmer is basically the opposite of a trauma echo? Glimmers are guided by your ventral vagal system. They make you feel safe and connected to other people. And when you call attention to your glimmers, it can bring a return back to that autotomic nervous system, right? It works it works the exact same way. It basically, you're talking to your parasympathetic nervous system, telling your telling it that you're safe and it can go into rest and digest and it can help calm yourself down and 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 that's self-regulation one of the ways that i work with my glimmers is i built my own glimmer um i've i, I started building this in 2020 when i first became a yoga instructor during the pandemic i moved across the country from arizona um, the Yoga Alliance lifted its standards and said now you can do teacher training online because you know, before you weren't allowed to do that. And that really opened a possibility for me because before I'd never had the time to be able to do a teacher training online. So I did my teacher training online and that's when I really started to learn about glimmers. And I decided that moment that I was gonna build my own glimmer. And so the first thing that I did was I started to research different things. So sunshine, let's talk about sunshine for just one moment. Sunshine is absolutely incredible. Um, there's so many benefits to being in the sunshine, right? I mean, obviously we have this really interesting and symbiotic relationship with plants and trees, right? So we we get a lot of benefits just from the plants around us and the plants, you know, they have a relationship with the sun. So that's one thing. Another thing is our brains need the sun. Our eyes process the sun and it, it, it changes our bodies organically. It makes a huge difference when we spend a little bit of time just in the sunshine. It helps us feel stronger. It helps us rest better. Right. Another reason is it tap the this is a good one is when you get sunshine in the morning time, like right when you wake up, if you get 10 minutes of sunshine on your face, you're getting your necessary daily vitamin D, but it's also starting your your um, circadian rhythm. It's it's in line with that. And it helps with with your metabolic health. Right. So this is how I built the glimmer. Um, obviously with the sunshine, there's way more information there. And I, I, I would dive into that rabbit hole because, um, when you have knowledge to support some of your healing path, you are able to actually put some intention behind that. And so it helps with the building of the glimmer. Like if you consciously know, I'm going to go outside and grab some sun because I need some vitamin D I'm going to kickstart my metabolism for the day. Um, it's going to help me with serotonin. It's going to make my root, my mood stronger all the things, right? It's going to strengthen that glimmer when you go in with that, that type of attitude, with that type of foresight. So learn more about the sun. So another thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to do find a way to build a glimmer that was kind of non-intrusive, something that I could do anytime. And so I landed on this particular yoga pose. It's called mountain pose. And so this is the first, the first place that I want to invite you to here, just to, you could do it in your own home. You can just do it intellectually with your own imagination. It's totally fine. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to root into the four corners of our feet, right? So you can stand up, 
I'm standing up here. I'm rooting in the four corners of my feet. Now, what's really interesting about that is see these four purple dots? Those are the four corners of your feet. Your toes are not part of that. So when you root into your four corners, visualize those four points of your feet growing roots into the earth. Now lift your toes like a big fan and spread your toes and then drop them down. When you're standing in that position, with your feet, you're super, super solid. You can have a little bend in your knee if you like. Um, straighten your spine, bring your hands facing forward, bring your shoulder blades together, almost as if you're trying to hold a quarter between your shoulder blades. And then if you will, imagine your eye, you're at the top of your head that there's a cord connecting you to keep you nice and tall and strong. This is called mountain pose, right? So this is what I do. This is how I build a glimmer. Every single morning, I start my day by getting some sunshine outside and standing in this pose. I also do a couple other things, like I, I do some intentional breathing and I practice some gratitude. And I do this for 10 minutes. I create this safe space within myself, right? And you can do that. So then that way, the next time you're in a position where you are experiencing a trauma echo, you can fall back into a glimmer that you built for yourself, right? You can ground into the earth. You can find that position. You can stand tall and you can do deep breaths. And it actually brings your body back into that, that, that place of safety, right? And that's part of that self-regulation practice. That's what self-regulation is. It's, it's starting to learn how to control your own emotions. It's creating that, that, that vibe for your own self, right? Which I think is really important. Um, Joanna says that she thinks yoga is an essential part of her life and always found it to be beneficial. And, and I agree with that. Me too. Ever since I started doing yoga, um, which at this point, it's been about 20 years, it's really made such a huge difference. Um, also, I just want to throw out there, I should have said this at the beginning, I love it when people put comments into the chat, right? Like if I say something, or we're doing something, and it feels good to you, put it in the chat, then that way we can have like a group conversation, and it makes everything so much more interactive, right? I love that so much. All right, so let's move on to the next concept. Here in the field, the field standard is to be trauma informed, right? Like that's that's the thing. We've we've this this idea came out in the late 1990s, early 2000s. That's when it really hit the field. Um, everybody here has an idea of probably of what being trauma informed means. I do think that we're supposed to stand on a platform of being trauma informed, but I'm not sure that that's enough. I think it's important for us to actually take the steps to be healing centered, right? Like we we meet our clients where they're at in their trauma and in their pain. But I think the next step is to help them find that path towards healing and help them reach post-traumatic growth. Now, the way neuroscience works and the way trauma works, I'm not sure that it's possible to ever be totally, completely healed from trauma. I think that you integrate the experience and you can learn how to, to unplug the pain. So to say, like if you go to EMDR DR ther therapy and yoga, you can kind of not feel the pain associated with that trauma anymore, but it's still part of your experience. So I think you're always walking that healing path. So we, but that's okay. We, we want to be healing centered. There's also post-traumatic growth and we want to try to reach post-traumatic growth, not just for our clients, but for ourselves, right? Interestingly enough, this particular training started off as a professional self-care type training. Um, but as the words and as the slides were coming together and as I was building this, I realized like this is advocacy. This is healing centered advocacy. We start with the ideas of what it means to be self-care what, what self-care means to us. We we practice self-care. We walk on that healing path, but then we help articulate the ideas to our clients so they can also walk that healing path as well, right? That's one of the things about my company, Strand Squared Solutions. The mission is to help pave the path from trauma to transcendence, right? We Being trauma-informed is meeting people in their trauma helping them transcend that trauma is that next possible step. And, and I think that that's important for us. It's, it's important for us to be able to do that. Now, if you notice, there's also being trauma organized. Um, it's really important to understand what happens in groups and how groups can, can become toxic together. And we're going to talk about that towards the end of this training. So, um, 
you know, I, I don't want to leave that piece out because it's important. All right. So my, my, my yoga path, this is me about, I'd probably say about 10 years ago and my court dog Yeti. Um, when I was still out in the field, we started a trauma sensitive yoga class for our clients, right? Because we realized we, we had a red body keeps score kind of, you know, before that, but we really started to see some great, um, some great change in our clients when they started pairing talk therapy with yoga. Since then, I've learned that it doesn't have to be yoga. It could be trauma sensitive fitness. There are certain elements in exercise and movement that make it trauma informed and, and inspire that healing. But yoga just happens to be that first place, right? Um, what one of the things that we did was we felt we wanted to have free yoga classes available to all of our clients. So I went and took all these yoga classes with all these different teachers until I found the one that was just kind, right? Just a real kind hearted, um, joyful person. You know how when somebody has that like joyful energy, she had the right kind of energy. We sent her to Kripala, which is the Center for Yoga and Health um, to get her certification. We also, got her hooked in with the trauma center for trauma sensitive yoga and she received another training from them and that's how we institutionalized it for our clients um, in our community now prior to this I had been attending a yoga class for about 10 years and one of the things that I learned when I got my apple watch was this this is heart rate variability I like to bring this up because a lot of people wear Apple watches. And so in your Apple watch, you're going to find this, this chart in the health app, right? Where it's just keeping track of your heart rate variability. And I just wanted to tell you what it means because sometimes, you know, we have all these weird apps and all this data, but we don't know, really know what it means. When you have a low heart rate variability score, that means that your sympathetic nervous system is more is is often activated. And that's the part of your nervous system that goes into fight and flight that is kind of moves into survival mode very quickly. That's the part where you're stressed out more. If you have low heart rate variability, you're more easily exhausted. You're um, less able to adapt and your cognition is decreased, right? With a high heart rate variability, that means you have more intellectual control over your parasympathetic nervous system which means that you're it's it's easier for you to self-regulate you can actually sit down and breathe and bring yourself back to a centered calm right you can move into rest and digest and we're going to talk about that in a minute you have higher improved performance your adaptability is higher and your cognition is is greater so the goal is to have a higher heart rate variability a healthy score is around 50, 50, 50 to 65, right around there is like a really solid, good athletic score, right? When you're down in the twenties, that means that you have low heart rate variability. And it's important for you to check your score if you're able to. Now, this is actually the birthplace of yoga. This is where it came out. There were some studies done and they just kind of noticed it. Um, this is one study. This is, this is way past the initial studies, but I, I liked this quote better. Longitudinal studies suggest that yoga exercise improves heart rate variability and cardiac autotomic regulation after just a few weeks of practice, right? Even just one bout of yoga can increase your heart rate variability immediately. So it has this like this huge impact. So I started asking, are there other ways to improve your heart rate variability? And there really is. One obviously is exercise, um, trauma-informed exercise specifically. Something, something that has that like somatic release really does make a difference because sometimes exercise can get kind of intense. It can cause more stress. Um, maybe you have a coach who's calling you out or you go to a yoga class and they put your hands on you and that makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Like that wouldn't be trauma informed and that doesn't help in this area. So it has to be like the good kind. If you're eating healthy food and staying on a circadian rhythm, that makes a difference. So getting that sunshine in the morning, um, eating healthy food. This is an interesting one. Stopping eating before bed, a couple hours, right? Like you want to stop eating like if you go to bed at say 10 o'clock, stop eating by eight, give your body a couple hours to digest your food. So then that way, while you're sleeping, your brain can do the things that your brain is supposed to do when your brain has like a day crew and night crew responsibilities. 
part of day crew responsibilities is digesting food. Night crew has all kinds of other things, including processing emotions and reconsolidating memories. All kinds of things have to happen at night. And if your body and brain are focused on digesting food at night, then that does not give your body a chance to do the things that it's supposed to do at night. So stop eating a couple hours before bed. Stay hydrated. Lots and lots of water. Good, clean water. Get plenty of good sleep. Lately, I've been adjusting my sleep patterns because I've been wearing another sleep app that captures my my sleep. I thought I was getting good sleep, but I was still waking up tired. And one of the things that I realized is I wasn't getting deep sleep. Like pretty regularly, I would go to bed and I would kind of hover in the light sleep area all night long and never get any good deep sleep or any REM sleep. So that's why I was waking up early. So as soon as I figured that out, I was able to, to, to adjust and make adjustments to make it so I can have a more balanced sleep. And I feel a hundred times better. Practicing gratitude, we're going to spend time on that. Breathing, we're going to spend time on that. And then cold thermogenesis, we're going to spend some time on that. And then practicing mindfulness is kind of woven through all this. And then, of course, um, avoiding alcohol as much as possible, right? Because it's it, it doesn't help with your heart rate. It doesn't help with a lot of things, actually. So regulation. We want to learn how to self-regulate so then that way we can co-regulate, right? So we're self-regulating so we can be healthy people. We can be grounded and heart-centered, but we also want to self-regulate because part of being a victim advocate or working in the field with people who have experienced trauma is to help them co-regulate. That's kind of like a base expectation, right? Like if you have a client who's yelling at you, you're not supposed to yell back, right? Like say, imagine a client is in your office and they just experienced domestic violence and they're really angry and they're just yelling, yelling, yelling because they're discharging some of the stress. And this is the first time that they felt safe um, in a really long time. And that just happened to be in your presence, which actually is a good thing that shows that your energy is really solid. If someone can discharge their stress in front of you. One of the things we've been taught is that when somebody is yelling in our presence, we take that as they're yelling at us and we start to yell back, right? That's not co-regulating, that's co-escalating. It's when we meet somebody's energy up here rather than helping them bring their energy down here. Let's, we'll come back to this slide, but let's, I'm going to bring on one of my co-presenters and she's going to explain it for us. No one else than me. Mom, are you ready to be his friend? Yes. Try not to be that that high up to be friends. I want everything to be low, okay? Okay. Just try your best. I, I don't want you and my dad to be replaced in, in meanies again. I want you and my dad to be placed as settled and be friends. I'm not trying to be mean. I just want everyone to be friends. And if I can be nice, I think all of us can be nice too. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to do my best in my heart. Nothing else than that. I want you, Mom, my Dad, everyone to be friends. I want everyone to be smiling. Not like being mad. I want everything to smile. Especially when I see someone, I want them to smile. Especially Nana, everyone. I want everyone to smile. And if that's for my dad and you, Mom, I think you can do it. I think you can settle your, your, mean, your mean heights down a little to short height. Then it's both, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be a bully. I'm trying to be steady on the floor, not way down, on straight, on the middle where my heart is. My heart, it's something. I, I think that that's incredible. That piece right there is 
absolutely incredible. I mean, she's really telling us exactly what it is. You don't want your mean heights to be way up here. We don't want it to be way down here either. We want it to be heart centered, right? It's, it's interesting is self-regulation is actually your vibe. It's that space. It's that cool, calm tranquility. It's that thing that makes it possible for us to be, to be really calm. So when we're able to self-regulate, we're more able to co-regulate. When somebody, when we're self-regulating and somebody comes and starts yelling in front of us, we can respond by having a calm tone. If someone starts making demands because they're discharging in a stressful way, then we can offer choices. If somebody is threatening consequences, we can offer empathy, right? If somebody's making public reprimands, we can start respond by having private conversations. If someone needs more space, we can just give them the space right if someone has aggressive posture we can respond by having more soft eyes now i picked this particular gif because in this movie brave there's this scene where she's riding her horse with her bow and arrow and she's shooting all her arrows and the wind is blowing and she's she's doing it in in movement right in order to be able to be that precise in her aim, she has to be very well aware of her own energy and her own space that she's putting into that. So we have to we have to really um, be that self-regulated enough to be able to shoot an arrow on on the back of the horse horseback. And and I know that I'm asking a lot because the more I dive into self-regulation, the more I recognize how difficult it is. It is really really difficult because here's the thing. When we've experienced trauma, and, and one of the things I want to be very clear about, I do think that the people who work in this field of crime and victimization, I do think it's trauma. We call it a fancy thing, like we call it vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue or parallel trauma. I'm not really sure that we need a fancy word for it. If you are working with case after case after case, day after day after day of traumatic situations, there's a good chance that you're integrating those stories into not just your brain and your thought process, but into your actual body. Like your body is experiencing this work so so look at it this way there's an original stress right like a, a moment of abuse or an assault um, when that happens there's this whole thing that happens inside your brain and we're going to talk about that in a minute and then you go off in the world you experience a trauma echo during that trauma echo everything that happened during that original traumatic experience happens again. Like maybe while you're experiencing the trauma echo, your, your muscles get tense, your blood flow is impacted, your nervous system changes, your heartbeat changes. You might have some issues in your guts. You get stuck in gut wrench and heartbreak, right? I love the way Bessel, Dr. Bessel van der Kolt said that you get stuck in, in gut wrench and heartbreak and all that stuff is activated. Your neurotransmitters flood your whole entire system and suddenly you're there. You're, you're there again and you're experiencing experiencing um, this again. This happens to our clients and this definitely happens to us. It's so important that we understand the mechanisms of trauma. I want to spend probably about 15 minutes just talking about a few of the mechanisms of trauma, like just a very brief neurobiology, psychophysiological, you know, response to trauma, just so we have some language to work with. So trauma, it's a deeply disturbing experience. It has an emotional shock and sometimes it can be very physical. To simplify, trauma is when threat plus loss of control happen together, right? When someone feels is threatened and they lose control of the situation, there's actual changes that happen in the brain. Your defense circuitry is activated, right? And we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna define what that means in a minute. But what's really fascinating is that even just the perception, like if you think that you're about to be threatened and lose control, right? The perception of th th threat and loss of control activates the defense circuitry and changes your brain in much the same way. So let's talk about the defense circuitry for just a second. First and foremost, you if you want to, you can get the palm of your hand and put it kind of on top of your eyebrows and go like this. Underneath this part of your brain is the prefrontal cortex. 
it's the part of your brain that's in charge of thinking and consequences and, you know, just being a logical human being. Um, fascinating factoid is this part of your brain isn't completely developed until 25, 26 years old. So all those teenagers making um, dodgy choices, well, they, their prefrontal cortex is developing, but it's not quite done yet. And then of course, you've got the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is one of, of several different ways that memories are integrated into the brain, but the hippocampus is important during trauma because um, it, it, what it does is it gathers all of the senses coming in and it organizes them. So when everything is, is fine and normal, the hippocampus is gathering stimuli from your eyes and your ears, right? What basically is happening is every single day, your brain is detecting the world around you. It's just watching and checking and finding things out. You're using all of your different senses to, to feel the world. You're seeing the world, you're hearing the world, you're smelling the world, you're tasting the world, you are feeling it on your skin. Now, obviously this, this image is a joke because you don't really have spidey sense or a sixth sense, but there are more than just these senses we generally work with your five primary senses but we we now know scientists are actually working really hard in this area um they we now know that there are way more than five senses some scientists say that there's upward to 50 different ways that we feel and interact and detect the world around us right and some are like well there's these eight and then they branch off so they're still debating to find out exactly how many this is an interesting place to pay attention to in neuroscience but for here basically we're detecting the world using our senses um the hippocampus gathers that sensory information and it kind of looks at it and says well this one's a short-term memory i'll file it into short term and this one is a long-term memory it's a total keeper i'm going to keep it forever i always kind of think of the hippocampus as a hippo on campus going to the library as the librarian right because the librarian goes and gathers all the information and stores it for us and then, of course, there's the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of your brain that's hardwired for survival. When your brain dis dis detects that something is wrong, um, the prefrontal cortex actually takes a step back and the amygdala takes over, right? The amygdala is in charge. The amygdala's job is like, we are going to survive the next day. The hippocampus, at that point, it's like the hippocampus is just like, I don't know what stimuli is going to be important. So I'm just going to gather all the stimuli. And instead of putting it away in neat, organized way, it just gathers it and holds on to it. It actually needs a couple of sleep cycles to reconsolidate those memories. Um, as like a little side note, when we do forensic trauma-informed interviews with people while they're escalated and their prefrontal cortex has taken a step back, asking them who, what, when, or why questions can be really problematic for the hippocampus because it's gathering the stimuli in a big pile and it needs some time for those memories to consolidate. That's where being trauma-informed is really, really important is in certain phases of our criminal justice system. Now, here's a film clip of what, it, what I imagine it looks like inside the brain when things are going well and the hippocampus is gathering memories and then all of a sudden there's detection that something is wrong. And so the hippocampus starts just gathering memories willy-nilly and putting them in a pile. Let me see. Right, so you see how that happens? Now, now we're gonna put a pin in our conversation right here, but we'll be right back. One of the things that I wanted to tell you about was laughter. Did you know there's all these benefits to laughter? If you ever need to self-regulate and you're like finding yourself viscerally rising and you're having a difficult time with a particular moment in time, laughing has all these benefits. It increases the, ser the serotonin and endorphins in your brain. It replenishes your lungs. It relaxes your muscles and ease tensions in your body. It reduces stress hormones in the body. It protects your heart. It increases your immune system functioning. And, and frankly, it's a really good workout. Let's watch this. Dwayne once said, humanity has unquestionably one really effective weapon, laughter. Power, money, persuasion, supplication, persecution, these can lift at a colossal humbug, push it a little, weaken it a little, century by century, but only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast. 
Against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Twain was right, except he forgot to mention laughter's ability to profoundly affect our health. Laughter is the best medicine for many scientifically proven reasons. Laughter is one of the best stress relievers. A good <laughs> bout of laughter can keep the muscles in your entire body relaxed for up to 45 minutes. Yeah. Now imagine cracking a few good jokes all day long. You'll never have a crick in your neck or an aching back again. Dr. Gulshan Sethi, a doctor of cardiosurgery at Tucson Medical Center, says that laughter is like internal jogging. It tones all the internal organs and strengthens the abdominals without ever doing a single sit-up. Laughter induces better social <laughs> relations. The contagious nature of a smile or a good laugh help us to connect with others leading to friendships and even romantic closeness. In fact, couples who laugh together are more likely to stay married longer. People who have enduring relationships have also proven to outlive those who have few friends and are unmarried. Laughter boosts our body's immune response. Studies have found that laughing at a funny movie or finding humor in a stressful situation helps to increase the production of natural killer cells. White blood cells that attack cancer, colds, and foreign bacteria. Laughter combats depression. When we laugh, our bodies dump a bunch of good neuropeptides into our bloodstream, including oxytocin and dopamine. Laughter reduces physical pain. Perceived pain levels in participants of many different studies are lowered when they laugh. Life may cause us pain here and there, but laughter helps us deal with it better. Finally, Laughter is a measurable trait found to be higher in those who are more resilient. If you want to find a successful person who can take the punches of life just as easily as the accolades, you'll find someone who laughs a lot. <laughs> laughter builds character and lessens rigidity. Mark Twain was a smart man. That's why he also said, those that respect the law and love sausage should watch neither being made. Now, here's the thing about laughter is you can actually use your mirror neurons to create laughter. And did you know that all of these things, all these benefits on the body can happen even when you're fake laughing? Now, I suspect that a lot of you are sitting by yourself, maybe in your living room or your office, you're watching this webinar by yourself. So since nobody's watching, I'm going to put on a video of somebody laughing. The challenge here is for you to laugh, right? And find out how that, that, that fake laughter, I mean, just start fake, just like start, <laughs> make it fake and find and witness yourself. If it starts turning into real laughter, I would really encourage you, I'd like to see it personally, for everybody to go in and raise your little hand emoji. So then that way everybody could see, right? If you're, if after watching this video, if it turns into from fake laughter to real laughter, raise your, your hand emoji. Let's watch this for a couple minutes. Couple, not a couple minutes, like a minute. <laughs> We've got some people raising their hands and I have another question, right? Did anybody else um, start to breathe deeply when they saw her breathing, right? Like you started laughing when she's laughing and then she started breathing. Did anybody else start to breathe? I know the first time I watched this, I thought, 
it actually made me breathe too. That's 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 our, our neuro our mirror neurons, right? You ever feel like so, whenever somebody walks into a room and you can feel their vibe, especially if we're connected with them in some way, those are our mirror neurons. We can actually feel each other. We see each other and we start to take on each other's um take on each other's energy. We feel each other's vibe. And that's really the root of, of empathy, right? And so we can find that vibe. And that's also the baseline of somatic experiencing and understanding your own body and self-regulation is to notice yourself when you're feeling this good vibe and then say, okay, I'm going to bring myself back to this particular space, right? And laughter is one of those pathways back, right? So that's why this actually feels kind of good. Like, you know that that's not really your hippocampus, but it's really, it's, it's, it's a funny way to talk about it. All right. So let's go back to this. Remember, we were going to come back. Your prefrontal cortex has taken a step back. Your amygdala is in charge. Um, somebody in the questions asked, is this why um, they say trauma victims are unreliable during the trial? I responded with yes and no. That's actually a whole nother training. There's so much to that, right? Like with, with tra victims on trial, we really have to be human centered and trauma informed. Um, I do think that victims are very reliable, but we, we are really good at creating chaos and mayhem for them, which we're, we become a, an extra barrier for them. Um, and I'd love to explore that further, but I do want to say that that's a, that's a bigger training. It's it's a good idea to start with the neurobiology of trauma in that space. I would encourage you to look at um, what it means to be a trauma-informed courthouse, what trauma-informed investigations and prosecutions look like. The more you dive down that rabbit hole, the more you see um, the different ways that we create mayhem. And, and somebody said in confusion, we, we kind of create a lot of that unreliability ourselves. And then when they're unreliable, we're like, what the heck just happened? You're being unreliable without seeing that we kind of created that in the first place. Um, so if you want to learn more about that at the end of this presentation, I'll give you my email address and I'm happy to jump on and just talk to you about it and give you some good resources. All right, so the amygdala has taken over, hippocampus is gathering all the stimuli, prefrontal cortex has taken a step back. Now, this is the moment when a lot of people start talking about fight and flight and freeze and fawn. Um, fight and flight was actually coined by William Canyon, Cannon in like 1915 or 1917, kind of a long time ago. He was a medical doctor and he was measuring adrenaline in the body during moments of high stress. So it's true, those two things happen, but I'm not sure that they're the best way to, to look at all of these things. I think that there's some more interesting um, models out there and neuroscientists are actually starting to think maybe we shouldn't think about it as fight, flight, and freeze right? Maybe we should look at it as survival mode. We move into survival mode. And when we're in survival mode, when the prefrontal cortex has taken a step back and the amygdala is in charge, we're in survival mode. The way we respond to that is can happen in two different ways. One is self-protection habits or survival reflexes. So first, let's learn about survival reflexes. Once upon a time, a long time ago, as humans, we all used to um, we all used to live in the woods together, right? And and we used to live outside. During that time period, there was actual tigers maybe living in that particular space, and and it was really scary. Um, and sometimes those tigers were super super stinky. And and tigers they make this weird sound. Listen. Right? Like tigers, they don't growl like we think they're going to growl. They make more like of a chuffing sound. It's like growl, growl, growl. It's more like like little growls back to back, right? Like it's a specific sound to tigers. Maybe you're in the woods and you hear this. Like leaves crunching on the ground, right? And then you smell this smell. What happens is, is internally you're, you're experiencing a trauma echo, right? Your body becomes activated, you're, you vibe, you're just like, okay. You're thinking there's a perception of threat, so we become activated because there's a very real, real possibility that there's an actual threat. If you smell a tiger, there's a good chance that there's a tiger around. And so we, we move into that 
that survival, um, we move into those re those reflexes, right? Freezing is actually a reflex. Um, and there's more information on freezing. Some people dissociate, some people um, actually collapse and go into tonic immobility. Everybody has a moment of frozen first where they detect, it's called detection freezing, where you're, everything is fine and then suddenly your brain detects that something's wrong. There's that moment of something is wrong. And then some people stay frozen longer and then some people go into survival mode, right? So all of that happens. Somebody in the chat said that there's tend and befriend. That would be under the fawning thing. What happened is we, we love to, to make these things, right? We were like, there's fight and flight. And then we learned about freeze. And so we're just like another F word, throw it out there. And then we learned about tending and befriending or pacifying and placating. And we're just like, well, that doesn't fit in the F model. So we called it fawning, right? Um, that's a little bit different. That's part of the, the, the survival reflexes, but it's more of a self-protection habit. Habits are not things, reflexes are things that we learned through evolution. Habits are things that we learned throughout our life, right? Like for example, here's this lady and she's learning martial arts and she's be, she's practicing this particular move. Like pretend that this is an hour long and she's actually doing this move over and over and over again. She's building that neuro pathway. When somebody comes up behind her and grabs her, she's gonna be able to flip them over. When somebody comes up behind her and grabs her, she's gonna be able to flip them over. She practices and practices and practices. You know how they say 10,000 hours makes you an expert? It's all about repetition for the brain. That's how your neuro pathways are built. The more you do something, the more solid the skill base is. So that could be a habit. If somebody attacks this person from behind exactly like this, she's going to be able to flip them. That's going to be her habit. But if even one variable changes, then it's no longer a habit, right? We don't practice this move against people that we love and trust, right? So if it's like her 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 husband who attacks her this way, she may not be able to do it because the variable has changed. She's been practicing in her head that this is a stranger move. Um, if the attack comes from the front, it might not work. If there are multiple attackers, it might not work. If there's a weapon, it might not work. If there's substance involved, it might not work, right? But the habit of that. Another habit is that spirit of being respectful or polite. That can be a habit too, right? And that maybe that could be, I'm, I'm not positive of this. The habit could be just like in a domestic violence relationship that, that we learn how to deescalate by being respectful or polite. Or maybe it's even the other kind of habit where it's like, okay, this person in the past has, has hurt me. So if I learn how to, to, do something a little bit different, I can de-escalate that. That's part of pacify and placate or attending and befriending, right? Spirit of being respectful can also be like quiet acquiescence when there's a sexual assault happen happening in that particular moment. So survival mode, that becomes really important for us to understand because what it comes down to it is trauma is not something that happened to you in the past. Something Trauma is something that's constantly happening all the time. I was on a plane recently. I booked an aisle seat. That would be better for me, I thought. As it turned out, I got scared anyway. Panic, it, it got me again. I was reacting to any strange sound at the back, any sudden loud noise. My senses were heightened, my hearing, the smells. If someone in front of me suddenly moved, I, I was like on the edge of my seat, like that. Danger from everywhere. I tried to keep calm. I did. I, I just get just get too tense, too tight. I can't swallow my mouth. It's it, it's dry. I'm numb. My head is throbbing. I, I'm a mess. I feel like I'm not actually on the plane. I don't know where I am. I, I'm just frozen. I hate it. Then I want to throw up. I, I tell myself it's just another panic attack to, to snap out of it. Just do it. But I can't. I try to think what the woman in counselling told me to remember when I get like this. It really helped. And then I realized why I was feeling this way. It was the bloke sitting next to me. He was wearing the same aftershave as the man who raped me three years ago. Oops.
I love this quote. The goal of treatment of PTSD is to help people live in the present without feeling or behaving according to relevant demands belonging in the past, right? That's the goal. And that's, now we're going to start moving into self-regulation. Like now we have this understanding. This is what happens when we experience a trauma echo. It's very similar to when you're actually experiencing the trauma, right? So we have to be very careful. We trip over each other's trauma echoes all the time. We can't actually warn each other about trauma echoes. If you really stop and think about it, like trauma, echo warnings before trainings um kind of miss the boat a little bit because trauma echoes are so related to to experiences right their their smells their sensations their feelings they're very individualized and it's so easy to trip over somebody else's trauma echo and suddenly they went from here to here they were heart centered but now they're escalated or they were heart centered and now they're down on the on the ground and we want to be able to stay heart centered to be able to do that but in be able to be able to do that we have to navigate our own trauma echoes now one of the things that I'd like to do is I'm gonna show you about two minutes of a clip and then I'm gonna give you a 10 minute break. Now here's the tricky thing about the 10 minute break. You only actually get like five minute break because for the other five minutes, I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework. I know super dodgy thing for a person to do, but it's only a, a two hour training. So I think it's fair. So let's watch this for just a second, just a brief bit of this. What makes you happy? Having fun, hanging out with friends, delicious food, making money? Well, consider this. Psychologists have scientifically proven that one of the greatest contributing factors to overall happiness in your life is how much gratitude you show. Yeah, think about that. Go ahead and marinate on it for a second. You can thank me later if you want. It'll make you feel better according to this study. You go ahead and click on it and read it if you want. Or you can keep watching because we read it and we thought it might be fun to test out for ourselves. We gathered a selection of volunteers to act as our subjects. First, we gave them a test. They didn't know what we were looking for, but it gave us a pretty good idea of their current level of happiness. We asked them to close their eyes and think of somebody who was really influential in their life, somebody who did something really amazing or important for them. We had them write down as much as they could about why this person was so important. Now, a lot of them... All right. So what they're asking you to do is to think of a person who has really done a lot of great things for you, who's really helped you in your life. And then just, just write, write that down, write them a little letter, write them a little note, just a little thing. Dear Bob, you helped me in these five different ways, right? You can make it really simple if you like. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna take a 10 minute break. And during that 10 minute break, um, I encourage everybody to, you know, go to the bathroom, get some water, whatever you need to do, and then take five minutes to to write this down. And then we're going to come back um, during this 10 minute break. I'm going to show a video. It's got a timer on it and it's got music. And, and right around the last minute, the music gets kind of amplified um, to remind you to come back. So so keep pay attention. To all right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Now, everybody has their video or has their um their homework. So go ahead and just kind of push your homework to the side. We're going to come back to it. And yes, that is a weird video, but it's a great break video. Um, that's why I like it. So let's go ahead and start with this. We're going we're gonna to get to your homework in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about breathing. Sometimes when it gets tense, or there's stress in the room or something happens or you you have this like this this desire to say something that maybe isn't super kind whatever it is right or you you are starting to co-escalate instead of being able to co-regulate this is the best thing if i could teach you anything at all it's to land on your breathing when you breathe deeply, it sends a message to your brain to calm down and relax. It activates your parasympathetic nervous system saying it's okay to rest and digest, right? Um, whenever you feel stressed and your heart starts to, to race and you start getting fast breathing, all of that is decreased when you take a deep, deep breath, right? Remember to breathe. Whenever something is gonna happen or whenever you need self-regulation, take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. Now I'm gonna show you two different ways that people um, can modify their breaths in order for them to be able to utilize the skill. There are times when we all experience feelings of stress or anxiety. In these moments, you can use your breath 
to help calm those feelings. Box breathing is a simple relaxation technique that can help you reset your breath and return to its normal rhythm. You can do it anywhere, anytime. Box breathing can help reduce stress and improve mood. It can also help with controlling and managing emotions. It's very easy to learn. Imagine breathing around a box. Inhale as you visualize going up one side of the box, gradually filling your lungs with air. When you reach the top, hold your breath for one to five seconds as you picture going across the top of the box. Exhale gradually as you imagine traveling down the other side of the box. Pause again for one to five seconds as you go along the bottom of the box. Then repeat. This can be done seven to 10 times in a row, focusing on the breath. And this can be done with your clients as well, right? Like you can help them with box breathing. Now, some people are not comfortable with holding their breath. Um, it's, it's a journey. And so that's why there's lots of different breathing techniques. So here's another one that you can use in case you're with somebody and that holding the breath part is uncomfortable for them. Let's face it. Life can be hard, stressful, and overwhelming. Sometimes when we get overwhelmed, we forget to breathe. If we hold our breath, the muscles tend to tense. One of the places we hold that tension is in our face and our jaw. If we hold tension in our jaw, that tension can spill over into other places in the body and stress us out even more. We're gonna practice lion's breath. I'm gonna show you the first one, and it's gonna be a little goofy. I'm gonna take a breath in through my nose and as I exhale, open my mouth as wide as I can, stick my tongue out and cross my eyes. I'm also gonna make a little sound. So here it goes. Take a big breath in, exhale. You can add on whatever you want, but make a little noise. Join me now. Take Children love that one, right? It's silly. It causes laughter oftentimes. I mean, I often, I use lion's breath pretty regularly with clients because it is silly and people feel silly doing it, right? Now, again, you're at home alone. So you could do this by yourself. No one's watching you maybe, right? Or maybe you're in a room full of who knows, but, but I challenge you to give it a try. So let's try it. Take a deep breath in and then go <laughs> Right. And how many of you laughed a little bit, thought that was a little bit funny, felt a little bit silly doing that. Right. I know I definitely do. So so those are two different ways that you can do breath. Now, one of the other ways that you can do breath or think about breathing, um, I'm going to show you. But first, I want to do a build up to it. One of the things that I did a lot in my career was safety planning. And, and I love to teach safety planning and um and I, and I think that it's really fascinating, teaching safety planning, working with people in safety planning. And one of the very first steps that I teach when I'm talking about safety planning or when I'm doing safety planning myself with somebody is I try really hard to reduce the emphasis on justice right from the start. I mean, we're the justice system and we get caught up on the court stuff and the trial stuff and all that sort of stuff, but that's not necessarily what clients want. And so when I'm safety planning with them, I recognize that they only have so much money. They only have so much time. They only have so much emotional currency. And so I kind of give them this exercise right from the get-go. If you have to spend your limited amount of resources on all of these parts of yourself, right? Like they have a physical body, they have emotional health and mental health, and they have financial health and professional health. They have relationships, they have a spiritual self, they have a personal self. And then of course, there's the path towards justice, right? Which of these do you think um, is, is the most important to you? And I actually have them rank them and their rankings are all individualized, right? Like they all, like some people have a huge emphasis on justice and, and then others are just like, I want to really focus on my financial health because that's how it's going to, that's how I'm going to heal from this. And then some people are just like, my relationships are going to carry me through this. Every person is different. But what is really surprising to me is a lot of people are focused, their, their top ranking in the top three is that spiritual self. And, you know, in the field, we're very secular. 
Um, and that's okay for us to be secular, but it's also important for us to recognize that a lot of the people that we're working with and part of their self-regulation process is spiritual, right? And by spiritual, I don't necessarily mean Christian. It's it's a broad concept of belief. It's that it's that part of a human that asks bigger questions, right? Like it strives to answer questions about the meaning of life, how people are connected to each other, truths about the universe and other human mysteries, right? Like it's that spiritual questioning. Um, we can, as advocates, take it from a very Unitarian lens. And this is another part of self-regulation because so many people have this really powerful spiritual side. And when you're working with clients, a lot of them will want to start here, right? They will want to start with their spiritual self. They feel like if they're right with their spirit, then they're going to be able to make it through anything. And so when we work with clients and we let them rank their own priorities and, and tell us what's important to them, you might find yourself working with somebody, you more likely will find yourself working with somebody who wants to get right with their God or wants to get back into their spiritual self before they move forward. When somebody is practicing spirituality pretty regularly, there's a lot of benefits to that. It improves physical and mental health. It enriches lives with positive and happiness. It is a social network, right? Oftentimes there's a lot of people around. It gives clarity. It gives a sense of purpose. It increases awareness and decision-making and it allows us to accept ourselves, right? And, and, and um, helps us fight stress and anxiety. So there's a lot of benefits to that. When we start thinking about things like yoga, yoga is a spiritual practice, and it's a big practice, actually. Um, in order to really, truly practice yoga appropriately without cultural appropriation, right? Like there's cultural appreciation, and then there's cultural appropriation. Cultural appreciation is practicing yoga by recognizing the wider spiritual practice that it is. And for yoga, they call it the eight limbs of yoga, which means there's eight facets of practicing yoga and you have to take that whole complete picture if you notice right here facet number three are the poses and the shapes right those are that's the there's only one facet that's focused on movement and the body the rest of the things are different things like the first facet the first limb of yoga is community ethics right embracing nonviolence, being honest not stealing you know not being possessive one is like keeping your body clean and practicing self-discipline having integrity learning more being a lifelong learner like just kind of being a good person and then of course there's the, the shapes a whole facet is breath right focus on how you breathe and how you use breath for self-regulation and then all of these are towards self-regulation cultivating that inner awareness and control like being able to control yourself being able to concentrate your mind being able to meditate because it's through that self-regulation that ultimate self-regulation that you're able to like reach that state of nirvana right so yoga is this like ultimate form of self-regulation, but only if you take it in its whole totality of using all of these things, not just the shapes and poses. Another spiritual way of looking at breathing, now I don't know if this is true, but I think it's very poetic and I like it. So in my head, I've decided that it's true for me, right? I, I found this meme and it said, there was a moment in time when God, when Moses had the courage to ask God what his name is, and God answered. And the name he gave is recorded in original Hebrew as Yahweh. Over the centuries, humans arbitrarily added the A and the E, and that's how we get Yahweh, presumably because we have preference and it's hard to articulate words without vowels, right? Scholars and rabbi have noted that the letters um, Y-H-W-H represent breathing sounds or aspirated consonants. And when they're pronounced correctly without the vowels, it's pronounced this way. And maybe that's why Yahweh is cons considered an unspeakable name because quite literally it's not supposed to be spoken. It's supposed to be breathed. And from our first breath to our last, we are speaking the name of God. And it's no wonder that when we hold our breath in fear, that we are told to take a deep breath to help calm us down, right? And I, I think that that's really poetic. 
Um, and, and when we're trying to tap into people's spirituality, if we're tapping into somebody who is part of the Christian tradition, tradition, this might help them with their breathing and help them with self-regulation, right? Just like if we're talking to somebody who maybe doesn't practice Christianity, but practices yoga, right? Being able to speak their own language and connect them to the breath that they're taking makes a huge difference, right? We have to be able to meet our clients where they're at in that particular space all right so let's go back to self-regulation we self-regulate for us and we self-regulate for the clients around us the next concept i want to bring you to is is based off this definition self-regulation is the ability to manage your own energy state your own emotions behaviors and attentions in ways that are socially acceptable and to help achieve positive goals now let's look at that it's the ability to manage your own energy state, your own emotion, your own behaviors, and your own attention, right? This is a this is a loaded question, right? So many of us are not really able to manage our own energy. Our, we're not able to manage our own emotions or our behaviors or our attention. And when I see attention, the way I think of that is, is our thoughts. Like sometimes we get stuck in thoughts and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, let's talk about the ability to manage your own emotions. This is a tough one. And the reason why it's a tough one is because we're not good at it. As human beings, we're not great. Oh, I've been to so many trainings and I used to train this way too, where we'd be like, okay, we find the facts by focusing on feelings, focus on your feelings and you'll be able to do all kinds of things. And then I read this book. I actually have it right here. I'll show it to you. It's this red book. It's got a big heart on it. It's called Atlas of the Heart. And of course, Brene Brown. Telling you, every time that woman writes her book, I have to re re redo all of my trainings, right? Because she's always she's always upping the game. Um, in the, in the beginning of this book, she talks about her research project. It says, in surveys taken by seven thousand people over five years, Brene Brown and her team found that on average, so these are average human beings, not people who have been victimized, just average people. Average people can can identify only three emotions when they're actually feeling them. Happiness, sadness, and anger. Now, 7,000 people over five years is a solid study, right? So on average, human beings can only tell when they're feeling happy, sad, or angry. That, for Brene Brown, was a problem because there's 87 different emotions. And so she mapped them out in this book. And then I wanted to find like a good representation of all of the emotions. And this amazing counselor was selling this image on Etsy. <laughs> so I, I bought the image to be able to, to use it here because it's, it's incredible um, because this is how Brene Brown lays it out. Like, for example, if you are feeling like you're hurting, right, in this sex, this place, when you're feeling hurt, then sometimes we start experiencing grief, sadness, despair, hopelessness, and anguish. Those are all the different feelings we feel when we're feeling hurt. Look at all those nuances. When we're feeling like life is really good, we experience joy, happiness, calm, contentment, gratitude, foreboding joy, relief, or tranquility. Those are all the different feelings we feel when things are going well. When we're with other people, we might experience compassion, pity, empathy, sympathy, boundaries, or comparative suffering, right? We These are all nuanced ways of interacting with the world, yet we as humans can only identify when we're feeling happy, sad, or angry, right? That's, that's 85 different emotions that we don't have the words for, that we don't really have the understanding. Like we can't really tell when the difference between being joyful or content or foreboding joy, like we don't have those, those, those abilities inside us. And, and I think that that's, that really becomes a problem when we're thinking about um, self-regulation, right? If, if our job is to be able to manage our own emotions, but the only emotions we can even identify in the moment is happiness, sadness, and anger, then that becomes a real problem for us, right? That means that we have to go back to the starting board. And when we're working with clients and we ask them to tell us what their emotions are, they may not have the language either because the average human being doesn't have the emotions. So we're actually need to start in the basement, right? I think that we have a lot, a lot to do in this particular space. I love this quote, he who controls his own thoughts controls his own destiny. 
And when it comes to controlling our own thoughts, there are so many different traps that we can get caught up in. We can get caught up in shooting. Um, like I won't should I won't should you if you don't should me, right? We can get caught up in tons of cognitive biases. There's over fifty different types of internal uh, of implicit biases. Um, we can over personalize stuff. We can have an all or nothing mentality. We can suffer intrusive thoughts or catastrophizing. Some of us have this like this need to be right all the time. We can magnet, we can be, you know, suffer from magnification where we're like just focused on one little thing and we miss all these other things. We can ruminate or have looping thoughts or overgeneralize. We can disqualify positive experiences. We have weird control fallacies, like all kinds of ways that make it really difficult for us. So it's hard to regulate our own emotions and it's hard to regulate our own thoughts, which inherently means that it's hard to regulate our own behaviors, right? These are some of the, the problematic um, trips in some of these spaces. Now, one of the ways that I like to do that, and, and we've kind of talked about a lot in this is, um, is just recognizing that all of these things are happening inside of our bodies. When we want to self-regulate, we can't just, it's not an intellectual endeavor. It's a full on body endeavor. And it's something that we can use, right? Like for example, take the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the longest cranial nerve into in your whole entire body. Um, it works to decrease your heart rate. It works to decrease anxiety and depression by opposing the sympathetic response to stress and inspiring the parasympathetic response. And it lowers your blood pressure. What we want to do is we want to be able to use our vagus nerve to calm ourselves down. But that also means that we have to have a strong vagal tone, which which um, means that we kind of have to exercise our vagal nerve. We have to get to the point. We have to regularly activate our parasympathetic nervous system in order to be able to activate our parasympathetic nervous system. You get what I'm saying? It's like you can't just do it automatically. You have to kind of keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and it gets stronger. Some ways you can activate your vagus nerve is um, breathing. Obviously, this like whole taking deep breaths it activates your vagus nerve. One is vibrating it. Um, did you know if you sing, it vibrates your vagus nerve? If you laugh, it vibrates your vagus nerve. If you get some water and gargle, it vibrates your vagus nerve. If you chant, you know how like there's all the monks and they're chanting all the time. That works because you're va you're vibrating your vagus nerve. That makes a huge difference. And then of course there's cold water. Cold water has all kinds of benefits, right? When you put your body into cold water or even just putting your face into a bowl of ice water, or you can buy one of these like weird tubs for your house, you know, even, even just the bowl um, of water or even just a cup of ice water um, helps. It increases your met met metabolic rate, boosts your brain health, helps you le live longer, resets your vagus nerve, burns fat and calories, boosts your immune system, accelerates muscle recovery, improves your mood, calms inflammation, and reduces sore muscles, right? There's all these benefits to super cold water. Um, one of the ways that I practice co-regulation with clients is by recognizing all of these things when it comes to the vagus nerve. So imagine this, you have a soft room, right? What we wanna do is we wanna build a soft room or even your own setting, you wanna build this for yourself. You wanna build a, a space that is safe to be in, right? Now remember, you don't empower clients. Like you're, you're not somebody who offers choices back to somebody or gives them power. What you do is you create an environment that's safe enough for them to access the choices that are already theirs and for them to feel the power that they're already born with. Everybody's coming to the table with their own power. It's just that some people have a harder time reaching their power because of outside external dynamics that bleed onto the inside. So we create spaces that make it possible for people to access their power. So anytime I'm working with a client, I utilize the physical setting. The first thing I do is I, I ask myself, how can I get to a point of co-regulation? Um, there's two big elements that are very important, self-determination and self-efficacy. Self-determination is when clients are, are allowed to um, 
make their own path, right? That's why safety planning is hard because sometimes they're going to pick a path that's different than the path that you would pick. Pick, But that's okay. It's their own path. Self-determination, making their own choices runs counter to the violence that they experience. And we have to run counter to that. We can't like be, we can't control them the way that they've been controlled in that, that, that violent situation. We have to create spaces where they can make choices. And then self-efficacy is that like oomph, that I can do it, I can act on my own behalf. So let's take those two concepts, self-determination and self-efficacy. Now in a soft room, we in an ideal soft room, there would be multiple places to sit. There would be a small chair, there would be a couch, maybe over here outside the picture, there'd be a, a table with some chairs, multiple places for people to sit. Then that way, when you come in, you can say, okay, here's this room, we're gonna meet in here. You can pick wherever you want to sit, wherever makes you feel comfortable. Now that self-determination, they get to pick. Even small choices starts to activate the self-determination and makes them stronger in that space. Um, another thing I would have in my soft room, ideal world soft room, would be some kind of unit like this, right? Where there would be a refrigerator. In the refrigerator, there would be cold water, right? Because remember the cold thermogenesis, if they're drinking cold water, that vibrates the vagus nerve. It could be cold cranberry juice that has antioxidants in it or cold orange juice. There would also be a tea maker that would have like peppermint tea or, you know, some kind of calming tea. Definitely snacks. Definitely something with sugar in it too, like a hard candy. Because sometimes people are super stressed out and their blood sugar levels are, are super wonky when they have to come meet with us, right? Like they're not eating and then they come here and their blood sugar and they just need something, right? So have a snack available to them. Antioxidants are really great because antioxidants impact the um, cortisol level, right? And it's really important for them to be able to do that. Um, I would stay away from caffeine type things because that's just going to escalate the stress that they're already in. And we want to utilize our settings to de-escalate and help maintain that calm environment. Like we don't want to introduce stuff that is going to make them stronger. Like when it comes to candy or sugar, just the hard candies will help. And then that with like natural sugars, like an orange and some dried fruit, that gives them the energy they need, especially if you're working with child victims. Um, Child victims don't need cake and candy and cookies and Coke, you know, because that's going to escalate the experience that they're already having internally. And we don't want to do that because that wouldn't be ethical or 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 um, appropriate. Another thing you want to have is, you know, have like all the fidget things, you know, like people, they need things for their hands. Sometimes we we if we're discharging our stress by these balls or playing with the fidget spinners or coloring or writing things down or crocheting all of those things make such a huge difference um in these space so you could have that all here when you introduce the client in say pick wherever you want to sit there's some snacks there's some reading material there's a blanket if you're cold if you crochet help yourself there's some you know whatever just make yourself comfortable in here and then leave Give them a little bit of time to orient themselves in the space. Give them some time to pick their chair, to look at the snacks, to stand up and walk across the room and get the water and come back down and sit down. That's self-efficacy. Standing up and walking across the room and, and helping themselves is self-efficacy and making the choices is self-determination. We want to do that. The next thing that I would it would would that helps with the with the co-regulation, right? Like this is stuff that you don't even have to do is off in the distance, I would have bilateral music playing very lightly, right? So there, it's just kind of hitting them. Bilateral music is the kind of music that hits one part of your hemisphere to the other. It kind of bounces back and forth, right? Now, I'm going to play an example of bilateral music. Um, it's only a couple seconds long. What I want you to do when I play this is I want you to close your eyes. Now, for some of you, you're not going to have that bilateral experience because your com your computer might not be working appropriately. Both of your, your speakers have to work in order for this to work well. And so in your software, make sure that you have a good sound system in this space to be able to utilize this. But, but um, for those of you who can hear the bilateral, I want you to close your eyes and pay attention to what your eyeballs are doing while this song is playing. I've got a record player that was made in 2014 Now my hair blue, came out of CC sort of green I like vintage just like when they fall Just lift my knees, I pretend I scrape them Crying in the trees All right, 
So using your little emoji hand, how many people could feel that behind their eyeballs? Right. So a lot of people could feel that. Right. When when the bilat this now this bilateral music is really it was it was created specifically for EMDR therapy. Right. Because EMDR therapy, what they do is they work with your trauma echoes and they unplug the pain from your memory. Right. So they do that in lots of different ways. They use tapping. They use bilateral music. They use rapid eye movement. Like basically they have you tell something painful that creates a trauma echo and then they unplug the trauma echo. So you still have the memory but it doesn't hurt anymore and it doesn't activate you anymore, right? So that's what the bilateral music, that's that's what this particular clip was for. Bilateral music can decrease the psychophysiological arousal, so it keep, can calm you down. It increases your attentional flexibility so you don't get stuck, you're not ruminating. It creates a distancing effect. So the problem that you're working on seems a little bit smaller and it decreases worry, right? Like in a soft room, here's a couple, you can use your QR notes or you can just go to Spotify. Um, these are two playlists. One's modern music. Like you'll notice Bohemian Rhapsody is on this list. That's bilateral music. Um, th these are Spotify lists, but you can go and just kind of Google um, bilateral music examples, there's whole albums, right? And a lot of them are just instrumental. They're perfect for soft rooms, just playing off kind of subtly into the distance, right? Co-regulation is already hard enough. You're already trying to self-regulate your own energy states, emotions, behaviors, and attention. And I know that that's not easy. The, this is a big ask. This is like something you learn how to do in like 10 years time, self-regulate. But yet you're in a position where you're expected to co-regulate and not co-escalate. In fact, as people who work in the field as first responders, we're supposed to be de-escalating people. You can't de-escalate somebody if you're not able to cope to self-regulate. Self-regulation leads to co-regulation and co-regulation leads to de-escalation, right? So we have to learn how to use that with ourselves so we can help somebody else. And that becomes, that's really a challenge, right? Here in the chat, somebody says, Al says, our bodies want to get rid of trauma. We are merely stewards of their that process. I love that so much, right? That's that's what it means to me to be healing centered. We meet somebody in their trauma and we know what trauma does. And then we help them find that path towards um, self-regulation, towards being healing centered, towards all of those different things. All right. So now um, one last concept and then we're going to get back to that gratitude thing. This is a biggie, and it's a really important one. It's really hard to practice self-care if you work in a toxic work environment. And here's the thing about toxic work environments, especially when it comes to working in criminal justice, is we're all experiencing trauma at work, right? But we're all coming to the table at with different levels of, of coping mechanisms and abilities to discharge. Some people are discharging their stress and they know how to ground and they're rooted and they're solid. Other people are discharging their stress all over the place, right? If we don't discharge our stress in an effective way, we often discharge sideways onto other people. And, and I think that learning how to discharge stress and self-regulate is pretty relatively it's a new concept kind of for the field. Like when we talk about self-care, it's not very deep oftentimes, right? A lot of self-care trainings are kind of, are, are just, they're, 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 they're missing some big important pieces. And so what happens is you have a group of people all working together in a space that has a lot of trauma happening and the organization itself becomes trauma organized. Right. When, when when an organization is trauma organized, the people inside the organization are often working in reactive mode or survival mode. They're often reliving or retelling old stories. Right. They get stuck in old old things. They're avoiding numbing. They're fragmented. They might even develop an us versus them mentality. There might be a lot of gossip or rumor making. There might be toxic loyalty. Toxic loyalty is when you can't have a difference of opinion, because if you have a difference of opinion, the community swarms on you, right? Like 
that's not great. There could be a lot of mobbing and bullying. And that's when, you know, the whole community decides this one person is a problem. So they all start kind of picking on this one person. And then what's really interesting is when there's mobbing and bullying, sometimes somebody inside the group kind of commits a bigger atrocity and that other person gets reabsorbed into the group and they start mobbing and bullying somebody else. There's always somebody on the outside and the group is always mobbing them. Um, and they're usually delightful, wonderful people. Groupthink is really strange and fascinating. Um, there might be a lot of inequality in this space and there might be some toxic or, or at least hierarchical based leadership, right? we've got to be really careful when these things happen. When an organization bunkers down and they're no longer working with outside agencies and when there's bullying and all of these things happening, when something bad happens, it happens in that particular space, right? And and, and we want to make sure that we keep our, our organizations clean and airy. I do think that organizational trauma is pretty common in the field. I actually think that it's kind of stormy. It's like you have good days and then you have bad days. It's like everything is trauma informed and healing centered and everybody's working well together and we're cooperating. And then suddenly a big storm rolls in and the environment gets super toxic. And then it kind of rolls out again and things are fine. Um, I teach an advocates course and oftentimes I get people because they have to do homework. Don't take my course if you don't like homework. I like it because they tell me what's going on in, in the world. And a lot of times they're like, well, I'm going to leave my job because it's a really toxic environment. And, you know, one of the things that I, I want to make, I think is pretty clear is that all spaces that work with trauma are prone to this stormy environment, right? It's really easy to say it's leaders. We have toxic leaders. We have a toxic work environment because our leaders are just toxic. But I think that that's missing some really big, important facets. One, I think it's really disempowering to everybody who works there. We all together um, create the, the, the atmosphere. We're all together weaving the reality of our set. It's like a group effort. Definitely think that leaders play a bigger role in creating the environment, but everybody creates it. And I've definitely seen places where we have good leaders, but there's somebody inside that's that's discharging their stress in a really toxic way and they're looping other people into that process, right? Like you've all worked with that one person who's like gossipy, 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 starting trouble, starting trouble, you know, and, and likes to do, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like we, we've all worked with that person before. So it's not always leaders. Um, we, we all have to kind of figure out organizational trauma. See, here's the other book I want to show you. This book right here called Organizational Trauma and Healing by Pat Vivian and Shanna Horman. It's really thin. I mean, I, when I read it, it only took a few hours. This was probably one of the most important books I ever read, right? Honestly, it is amazing. It is an amazing work because a book because it really um, puts puts um, into language some real big experiences that I had seen happen in the field. And, and I think that we all play a role in creating that healthy work environment. Like we all play a role in building resiliency as a community. And I think that that's really important for us to understand, right? The health of our organization is an ethical obligation, but it's a community obligation. It's a systemic, it's an organization. Like we all have to kind of put some effort into building resilience as a community. Community. All right. So you had homework. You had to write a letter. Let's 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 continue on that path and then we'll start closing out. We thought at this point the experiment was over until we really put them on the spot and tried to get them to call that person and read what they wrote about them. Thank you, <laughs> Jessica. We're gonna have to have you call your mother. So who is that right person for you? Person is my sister Erica. We're gonna give Erica a call. <laughs> Okay. Who'd you end up picking? Friend of mine, uh, Craig Ains. Her name is Dora. My college accounting instructor. Really? Mm -hmm. Is this somebody you're still in touch with today? No, I'm assuming that he's passed on. That's, that's a <laughs> shame. To the great beyond. You up for it? Um, uh, yes. What would you say if we called up Dora? Oh, well, we can try, but she lives in Britain. In Britain? Oh, no, never by heart, dude. This is awful. That's fine. I don't know my mom's number by heart. If it's true that uh, those who are going on are looking down on us, maybe he read my chicken scratch. Hey, sweetheart. 
Hey, how you doing? Um, yes. You got a second? Where you at? In the hotel? I am. I'm in the hotel. Uh-huh. You scared me when you asked if I had no. a second or something was wrong. No. I'm on this, I'm on like this little TV show, and they told me to talk about the person that influenced me the most, and I picked you, and, then, and they're, making uh -huh. me call, they're making me call you. Oh, wonderful! Hi, you reached Craig. I'm not here right now. At the tone, please record your message. Oh, come on. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Erica, it's me. All right, so i got to read you this paragraph. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, All right. sweetheart. All right, the person that influenced me the most would be my mother, Marlo Dawson. She is a single mother of two. She is a very hard worker and dedicated to her family. Hey, Craig, this is Loie. Um, this is going to be a funny little voicemail, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm so sorry for calling you at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I have to read this to you, okay? And you can't say anything or, I don't know, you can respond, but I probably will just keep going. <laughs> okay? Is everything okay? Yes, but I have to read this out loud to you. The person who has had the biggest impact on my life outside of Jesus Christ, who is responsible for my existence, was my college accounting instructor. He had a joy and enthusiasm for his job like no other teacher I have ever known. I love her to death and she keeps me going with positive talk. She is a woman that knows what she wants and won't give up until it is achieved. Oh, thank you. I, I, I don't know what, I'm about to cry because it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have, I have to say that it's just wonderful. I first met Craig on an independent feature film set in Whitefish, Montana. I recently have been sending Craig a lot of positive thoughts as he's suffered a series of health problems. Despite his medical problems, he's continued to work and take pleasure in the small things in life, like sitting quietly with, with his wife, Janine, on the porch. Erica is my older sister and my best friend. <laughs> Sometimes it even feels like we are twins. She's my number one fan and my number one supporter. She makes me happy because despite all my mistakes and my decisions, she still loves me no matter what. Your friendship is everything. And you are, you are one of the most important person in my life. You know, I encourage you to take your letter. Right. I encourage you to 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 read it to the person that you wrote it to and try it. Just see. Just see what that level of vulnerability is. I mean, honestly, I um somebody in here, Marla, said that that you know they did that during the Strand Squared course. And yeah, I've been doing this activity, asking people to do this activity for a really long time. And it's really profound. It's really uncomfortable because we're not used to sharing that level of gratitude towards somebody else. But it's amazing because the gratitude challenge does a lot of things. Practicing gratitude has a lot of benefits, right? It really makes a huge difference because of the way that our brain works. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating about our brain is, you know, we're looking at all the world through our senses, right? Like through what you see, what you hear, you taste. We, we, we talked about how we see how the hippocampus works and how, and there's other parts of memory too that form um, and make sense of what we're seeing. It makes meaning for us, right? Now, the only way that meaning is made through the senses is based off of your personal experience and your, your history, right? Everything that you've experienced in the world is drawn upon to make sense of what you're seeing right now. Like, for example, I'm sitting in a little office. I've got a window right in front of me, and right outside is, is a whole bunch of flowers blooming in the spring. Now, when I see the flowers, I know that if I went outside and could smell them, there would be a smell. Like I can honestly, I'm sitting in a room with the door closed and I know that the outside smells good because I've got the experience of smelling those flowers before, right? Like that's how everything works. Everything that you see is being framed and your perspective is developed by your past history of the world. I love this quote. You are the books that you read, the films that you watch, the music you listen to, the people that you meet, the dreams you have, the conversations you engage in. You are what you take from these. You are the sound of the ocean, the breath of fresh air, the brightest light, the darkest corner. This is my favorite part. You are a collective of every experience you have had in your life. 
You are every single second of every single day. And, and I think that that is really important to understand. When we spend a lot of time practicing gratitude, it changes the way that we perceive the world, right? And that really is important. When you spend time focusing on all the things that are good for you, that are positive for you, it changes the way that you view the world, which changes your relationship to the world, and it changes your experience with the world. There's all these health benefits, right? It says it improves physical health and healthy coping skills. It promotes positive emotions. It improves your relationship. It eases depressive and anxiety symptoms and it aids in post-traumatic growth, fosters self-expression acceptance, encourages altruism and compassion, increases self-worth and self-esteem, all these things. And all of these things are rooted in, um, are rooted in science. There's been a lot of research done on the health benefits of gratitude. It really is a big way. And it's a great way to self-regulate. If ever you're feeling like viscerally drained and so tired, you know, those moments where you're just like, Bleh. I feel like just awful. And now I have to see a client this afternoon and it's hard to be all there all the time for clients. This is one of the things that I do. If I have to meet with a client and I don't really feel like it because I'm just drained, I'll call somebody and tell them how grateful I am. And usually that phone call is enough to recharge my battery to make it through in a way that is important for clients because our clients deserve to have workers who are able to connect with them who are able to like be all present in that moment with them they've just experienced what could have been the worst day of their whole entire life or a series of worst days of their whole lives we're working with victims of crime this person is having the worst day of their whole life they deserve somebody to respond who's able to heart connect and sometimes that heart connection is really hard right? So so we do the things that we need to do. We self-regulate for us, but we also self-regulate for them. So this is a lot of information. Um, obviously, there's so much more in this particular space. Um, I encourage you, you can download this if you need it. I can send it to you via email. I'll give you my contact towards the end, but it's a self-care plan. It's a big self-care plan. The goal of this plan really is just to kind of help you see that learning how to self-regulate is a big deal. It starts with self-care, but it actually is so much more than that, right? And self-care is so much more than just having some chocolates and a glass of wine at the end of the day. In fact, those are not even self-care. That's like self-comfort, which is totally different than self-care, right? So this, this tool can help you. It's just for you, you know, read it over and, and you know, think about what you do in this space and how you do that. And you do that because you're totally worth it, right? You're totally worth being able to stay healthy and, and work in this field. And also because the people that we're working. Try to find strategies that include not just your brain, but also your body, because we're it's connected. I love this quote. We cannot hate or be angry without an organism that hates and is angry. We cannot love and hope and expect without actively, movingly, physiologically loving and hoping and expecting. Hate, anger, love, and hope are not physio are not psychological states existing in a mental vacuum. They are somatic states that exist in the entirety of our living organism. Um, this painting is actually done by Alex Gray. He's a he's an artist that lives in New York City, but he also has a, a um, museum type place in Poughkeepsie. So I would encourage that. I like to end all of my presentations with some music or something inspirational. I'm going to play for you this song. And then after that, I'll give you my, my, my closing slide. So this song is dedicated to you in your journey of self-regulation and being able to, to reclaim that space, that, that place where you can be completely and totally authentically you in order to be able to help other people. And so for those of you who need my contact information, um, here it is. It's Here's my um, website, my email address, um, some shameful promotion you can download. I'm hosting a speaker series. If you need a full or partial scholarship, let me know. But all of these speakers are absolutely amazing. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'll hang back for a few minutes. Myra, thank you so much. Everyone, I put the link to the slides, the evaluation link, Myra's contact information is also in the chat. Please take a couple minutes, complete your eval for us. We'll, we'll get that feedback directly to Myra in the coming days. 
And then a few of you have already asked about uh, links to today's recording, and it'll be there in the next day or so. It usually takes us to get it uploaded to YouTube. We'll share a link with all of our attendees from today. And before uh, we end the, the actual recording, don't forget, join us on April 17th for a second. Myra, this was a perfect start to the month. April is a big month in the victim services field. So I can't thank you enough. This was very profound and timely. So, oh, and multiple comments on this too. Shout out to Daniel and Remy for their tremendous work translating. Oh, great. For us I today really too. enjoyed that. <laughs> thank you, Daniel and Remy. I really, yeah. it was amazing. All right. We will happily keep things on for a couple more minutes, but I am going to end the recording. Everyone, thank you. Have a wonderful day and, and, and a wonderful month. Thank you.